Hmm. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, the screen. Is... Uh, yeah. Can can I go ahead? Uh, please uh, share screen once. Sir. It's not visible hmm. right now. ियसली <laughs> i am at the receiving end and so are you friends we have a lot to cover today it's a vast uh, topic complete litigation process covering show cause notice adjudication and appeals under gst law the we have about 3 uh, hours uh, torturing session and uh, i'm sure all of you will bear with me uh, i will try to take a 5 minute comfort break at about 5:30 but after one and a half hour today my endeavor will be to not only deal with the legal aspects of this litigation related provisions of the cgst act but also uh, just to highlight certain practical aspects of the litigation process there are about 170 slides in this entire presentation which gst corner will uh, arrange to share with all of you the don't worry i do not intend to nor would it be possible for me to cover all the 170 slides but it also contains uh, statutory provisions just to make it as comprehensive as possible i have avoided uh, putting the statutory provisions governing the appeals in this uh, presentation only because then it would have become too bulky because the, to put all the 107 to 121 into this uh, presentation would have been quite too much so i have just avoided them we will also have a question answer session as the organizers have advised me at the end of the session i'll try to deal with the questions as much uh, as far as possible considering the time availability and the comfort level of the participants uh, before i start with my talk friends uh, i will uh, you know very heartily express my gratitude to gst corner for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my views and thoughts on this all important aspects of the gst law and for that matter any tax law it has always been a pleasant a pleasure on my part to you know uh, whenever uh, gst corner have been they are very active on this front trying to advise trying to guide and try to keep the tax payers and tax professionals across the country update uh, and uh, putting in lot of efforts lot of research it is really heartening to see that this one particular portal is really really trying to do their utmost to keep the people updated and fully guided on the various aspects of this law and again it is my pleasure today to be on their platform and share my thoughts on this subject with you i'll come straight to friends uh, suppose notice the all the tax laws be it direct tax laws or indirect tax laws have never been immune from the litigation the litigation has been ban of the tax laws particularly though it may be boon for the tax payers and uh, maybe boon for the tax professionals we have all been frequently reading about the huge pendency of the cases at the tribunal level high court level and supreme court level and the story is more or less the same on both the taxation fronts whether it is indirect tax or direct tax in indirect tax 
the position is much more serious with the thousands of appeals still languishing for the final hearing in the various benches of the tribunal across the country covering customs excise and service rates the causes behind the tax disputes uh, need not be really you know unknown we may not be very much unfamiliar with that we all know the reasons the first and foremost is vague and poorly drafted tax legislations and as walter has famously said the you know worst laws are the you know poorly drafted laws are the worst sort of tyranny arbitrary interpretation by the revenue officers once the tax legislation once the tax provisions are not properly drafted then it gives the scope for arbitrary interpretation to the revenue officers and at times even to the tax payers as well then whereas the tax avoidance uh, tendency of the tax payer also obviously leads to the tax disputes after all as somebody has very famously remarked tax avoidance is probably the only profitable uh, business remain in the today's world pressure of revenue targets for some reason and another india has remained uh, the target oriented society as far as that revenue is concerned government after government year after year through the budget have been actually fixing the revenue targets it may be inevitable but it is the process through which this revenue targets are being fixed and the very impracticality at times of those revenue targets but at the same time putting unsurmountable burden on the revenue officers to meet those targets we got there somehow who the hell cares how that attitude which is getting generated amongst the revenue officers which is uh, the probably the biggest single biggest cause for the disputes and at times as i have been always saying a target oriented tax regime will ultimately be become terror oriented terror driven tax regime then frequent amendments we are witnessing this already in the just four years short life span of gst if somewhere uh, if one would really go it into the original law particularly on the implementation aspect procedural aspect returns related aspects that what was the original provision and how many times they have been amended one would really get lost on this jungle of amendments then the all pervasive retrospective amendments we have already seen two major amendments which have been made retrospectively by finance act 2021 in uh, the cgst act 2017 no doubt the one amendment to section 50 sub section 1 relating to the interest liability only on the net cost person may be uh, a beneficial one the point is this could not this have been avoided in the first place why there has to be an amendment and that also retrospective that is the moot question this entire controversy which started with the orissa court judgment in mega engineering could have been avoided with the some some pragmatic and uh, some drafting with the foresightedness and then comes the doctrine of mutuality and the attempt to wish away that impact of this doctrine of mutuality as propounded by supreme court in kolkata clubs case and the amendments made to section 7 red with schedule 2 to the cgst act however fortunately uh, as of now this amendment has not yet taken into effect it is a dead letter Uh, in in the form of dead letter in the cgst act having become part of it on 28 march 2021 but not yet notified by the government so uh, today the doctrine of mutuality prevails but then once it is made live by notifying a particular date by the government it will take effect from 1st july 2017 and all hell is going to break loose among the tax uh, on the tax payers so retrospective amendment we all i always say this uh, this particular there are two amendment one is also lurking around and that is the dri related the canon india's case of supreme court and again one more judgment announced by the supreme court day before yesterday pushing i mean you know uh, declaring the socos notice issued by the dri ultimately my feeling is that it is also going towards the retrospective amendment and then again challenge to the retrospective amendment so section 7 cgst act and dri related section 28 customs act provision in the retrospective amendment they are actually the law affair vodafone of the indirect tax and then confusing clarification at times by the cbic though cbdt is much more cautious and alert on to pragmatic on this but uh, yes cbic quite a few clarifications leave much to be desired 
conflicting judicial pronouncements and then the excessive delegation which we are facing particularly under coming back to gst regime the badly drafted gst laws i have been always maintaining gst is poorly misconceived hastily implemented badly misunderstood and arbitrarily implemented law and we are witnessing the fallout of this uh, state of affairs in a short span of 4 years hardly at least i have never come across a single tax legislation uh, in a, in my 3 decades old career where in the just short span of 4 years after it has taken the birth there is there are so many challenges in the high courts through the raids against the various provisions of a one single legislation and this is not the work of the trigger happy lawyers believe me there are substantial issues on which the constitutional validity of the provisions have been challenged before the high courts as far as the gst is concerned the moot question is why the one single answer is the the poor design and the structure of the law very bad drafting loose drafting and then its arbitrary interpretation gst law also suffers from excessive delegation it is a subject by itself and in coming days my feeling is that this excessive delegation is coming going to come at the center stage of the gst related controversies and maybe the challenge before the courts why there is a wide scope for arbitrary interpretation then another very disturbing feature is the apparently state gst authorities unfamiliarity with the finer nuances of the litigation under indirect tax gst as you know that we have the state government authorities and central government authorities manning this law simultaneously as a, under in a conjoint manner the indirect tax uh, which has been subsumed like custom excise service tax has always have very well defined process of litigation starting from the investigation search and then against seizure and then shokos notice audit uh, audit objection resulting into shokos notice adjudication first appeal tribunal whereas in the wet particularly the concept of shokos notice uh, as prevalent under customs excise and service tax was never witnessed and then gst is all said and done remains extremely complicated law when there is a lack of insight into all these aspects particularly at the level of the state gst authorities then obviously it is an open invitation to the litigation another serious aspect of this is the tax frauds leading to stringent action friends gst or wet whatever you call it has always been a fraud prone tax and india is not the only country at the receiving end world over about 198 countries who have adopted gst as their indirect tax policy all major countries particularly if you talk about forget about the small countries if we talk about uk overall european union australia south africa canada these all countries are suffering from the frauds taking place under the gst or wet regime the finest uh, probably the best form of gst or wet implemented all over the world are probably the two countries and they are new zealand and singapore all other countries uh, sibren notion the netherland based international tax expert has uh, divided the entire gst world into three categories and he has taken the cue from the epic western spaghetti film of clint eastwood the good the bad and the ugly mr nosen divides the world gst world into the good the bad and the ugly new zealand and singapore he puts under the good south uh, the uk european union and canada they put he puts into the bad and brazil the second country adopting gst after france way back in 1954 and uh, 1940 eight and then 1967 other the second country the brazil and then south africa both he puts into the ugly i don't know i am afraid that whether india would give some consolation to south africa and brazil or not and once there are tax frauds obviously it leads to harsh action on part of the revenue authorities which we are witnessing today no need to dwell upon it and as always happens such stringent action or amendments which are made at times very impractical ultimately it is the victims will be the by and large the compliant and the honest taxpayers 
instead of the fraudsters who normally manage to get away. This is clearly, clearly we are seeing uh, under the GST, and we hope that this would be somehow somewhere stopped here. Ill-conceived design and structure, no need to get into this frequent amendment. All these ills are actually, unfortunately, are plaguing the GST regime as of now. No doubt, GST Council is seriously trying to really get its act together and undertake the serious course correction. How soon it can be done, how pragmatically it can be done is really a matter of one has to only wait and watch. My personal feeling always would be, which I would time and again conveyed, is that unless it becomes extremely necessary, uh, one need not now, one should not, government should not undertake any major amendments unless it is inevitable. Let this loss be settled down in the manner in which people have understood, all, all the stakeholders have understood. And simultaneously on the sideline, a fresh exercise should be mounted to redraft the entire law uh, the, by roping in the, there are stalwarts and there are experts in this country who have a rich experience behind them from the professional world and also from the revenue department, obviously. It should be a joint affair like the DTC and a fresh new law should be drafted and that should be, maybe it may take another three, four years, doesn't matter. Drawing the experience uh, from the GST's four, five years implementation and from world over. Uh, let us hope something will come out on this. Coming to friends, the tax litigation process under GST. Generally, uh, the stage-wise process will start like assessment. Then if there be uh, need be show cause notice, adjudication, appeals, which will have two uh, layers, First appellate authority, which is in the income tax language, which many of you would uh, readily understand, and that is CIT appeals. We would call it the commissioner appeals and appellate tribunal, which is as of now not in existence. From there to high court, and then from there to Supreme Court. On the sideline, there is a revision powers vested in the authorities under section 108. Then there is a prosecution related uh, provisions, uh, including investigation, search and seizure and confiscation and then compounding of the offenses. Uh, a very short point which I would like to make on assessment is that assessment need not be understood in the manner in which it is uh, traditionally being understood by all. There is no such assessment provision under the GST law whereby the returns which are being filed by the taxpayer will be regularly assessed and it will be the taxpayer will be intimated about the assessment and return. It was not there even under excise. It was not there in a, even under the service tax. In other words, in income tax and the rust while weight regime, the returns which were being actually assessed and assessment order used to be passed after assessment. No such provision exists. No such actually practice is also being adopted under it. It has been done away with in uh, almost uh, nearly 25 years, almost more than two decades back, right from excise when we switched over to self-assessment. Earlier classification list, price list, and RT12 returns filed by the taxpayers monthly, they were used to be assessed and then they were used to be verified and a copy used to be given to the taxpayer. This practice has, stopped, has been stopped long back. It is all self-assessment. However, then there are uh, like, uh, you know, the assessment powers in the special circumstances given to the assessing officers where he can undertake the assessment in case of uh, certain circumstances, but we need not get into that. I'm just telling you that there is nothing like the monthly return assessment which would be undertaken or required under the GST. Then with this, let us now start with the show cost notice. Friends, so cost notice, the basic principle uh, provisions are contained in section 73 and section 74. Rule 142 lays down the process. Impl uh, basically, it is a machinery provision which lays down. Section 73 and 74 are the two only, I repeat, two major, two only provisions which provides for the issue of the SOCOS notice if any tax is short paid or not paid or refund erroneously granted or ITC is wrongly availed or wrongly utilized. Now, our the discussion which we will now, which will now follow will be in the context of these two provisions, including Rule 142. 
the first is authority empowered to issue the sokos notice if you see section 2 sub section 91 defines the term proper officer and it says proper officer in relation to any function to be performed under this act that is cgst act means the commissioner or the officer of the central tax who is assigned that function by the commissioner in the board there are two very peculiar expression which is coming for the first time under gst law it was never there in excise custom and service tax and that is commissioner in the board there are and both are separately defined commissioner in the board has been defined this commissioner in the board has been used in certain sparingly in some about six to seven sections provisions and you will find the basically he is a officer of the level of the uh, the deputy secretary or joint secretary in the board and he has been given powers under certain specific circumstances the why proper officer word is important because if you carefully uh, read section 73 sub section 1 and section 74 sub section 1 you will find that it says the sokos notice has to be issued by the proper officer so if it is issued by any officer who is not a proper officer for the purposes of section 73 or section 74 then the notice will be without authority of law and therefore it will be null and void at the threshold itself and therefore one needs to understand that whether the notice has been issued by a proper officer or not why did circular dated 57 2017 the board has actually notified specified the proper officer for the pro, uh, for various provisions other than registration and composition under the act and they were assigned the various functions for the, which included section 73 this circular was amended thereafter by the circular dated 9 february 2018 whereby the board has designated all officers up to the rank of additional or joint commissioners of central tax including the superintendent as the proper officer for issuance of the sokos notices and orders under various provisions of section 73 and 74 the sum and substance of this board circular is that the right from superintendent then assistant commissioner deputy commissioner joint commissioner and additional commissioner these officers are empowered to issue a show cause notice and also issue an order in terms of under a various sub provisions of section 73 or 74 uh, as because they are designated a proper officer for this purpose by the board by the latest circular dated february 18 two important aspects here is the one is an inspector level who is uh, subordinate to superintendent an inspector cannot issue a show cause notice one for under section 73 or 74 similarly the commissioner has also not been designated as a officer who can issue a sokos notice and adjudicate the matter i'll come to that at a later point of time this is an interesting departure from the erstwhile practice being followed under excise customs and service tax the the first aspect which we need to see there are certain established principles of law which need to be kept in mind when we actually deal with the shokos notice the just as the proper officer only can issue a shokos notice uh, board has also notified by the circular dated 9 to 2018 the monetary limits for the issue of the shokos notice this is mainly for the proper and uh, you know uh, demarcation of the uh, work between the officers Uh, and augment the you know scarce resources available with the department so the work is basically divided based on the uh, monetary powers so that one particular officer does not get you know loaded under the mounting uh, shokos notices these monetary limits are notified by i will not go into the details these are all available on the cbic site uh, i am only giving you the reference the important the first question that arises here is if an officer who has been uh, give, uh, you know for whom the monetary limit is prescribed like superintendent 10 lakhs or an assistant commissioner deputy commissioner 50 lakhs uh, i mean i'm just giving you an example i'm not going into too much nitty gritty if he issues a sokos notice for an amount demanding an amount which is in excess of the monetary limit 
prescribed for him will it become invalid this is the first question we need to understand such monetary limits uh, were also prescribed by the board under the erstwhile excise service tax regime also and by the circulars and this question had arisen and reached the supreme court in the context of power chemical in the case of power chemicals where the precise question was whether a socos notice issued by an officer uh, in excess of the monetary limit laid down for him uh, will become invalid the three bench ju uh, three judges bench of the supreme court in power chemicals said that administrative direction of the board allocating different works to various classes of officers cannot cut down jurisdiction jurisdiction vested in them in the statute and may be followed by them at best as a matter of propriety it was further held by the supreme court that the issuance of the socos notice or adjudication order contrary to such directions could not be set aside for want of jurisdiction especially as no prejudice is posed to the ssc because of that this is an important judgment whereby the supreme court uh, posed the challenge to the validity of the socos notice and the order passed by an authority in excess of the monetary limits prescribed by the board it is our common understanding that the board circulars are binding on the departmental officers even if they are contrary to the law however this particular proposition of law has to be seen in the context of each case it need not be and cannot be taken as a uni universal uh, law of application the supreme court said that they are supposed to follow these administrative directions as a propriety but in the absence of anything in the statute which actually requires the officer to adhere to that monetary powers but otherwise who is competent to issue the show cause notice the board circular uh, on the monetary limits cannot be a ground to post the proceedings a similar view was expressed by supreme court in avon construction products and very recently in the context of gst this issue had been raised in the in terms of this february 18 circular before the gujarat high court in palak designer diamond jewelry case the first matter it was challenged it was a case of caesar the caesar had been challenged then i could directed the release of the jewelry and the seized the stock uh, on with some few crores of duty advance uh, gst had been demanded uh, on execution of some bond of some 50 lakhs and all this was challenged by the revenue by way of a review petition it was dismissed against that the revenue has approached the supreme court and the there is a gujarat high court judgment has been uh, dismissing the review petition has been stayed this is one part of the story this caesar had ultimately resulted into the issue of the socos notice this socos notice validity will challenge on the ground being in excess of the monetary limits laid down by the board circular of february 18 and this was actually uh, this challenge was dismissed by the gujarat high court in 2019 TIL 1756 uh, uh, High Court Ahmedabad following Power Chemicals in Supreme Court and High Court then uh, referred back the matter for the for, uh, with some directions based on those High Court's observations upholding uh, following the Power Chemicals Supreme Court Tribunal Ahmedabad Bench has ultimately dismissed the challenge to this uh, validity of the Socos notice in Palak Designer case. Uh, on the ground ke it exceeded the monetary limits this is the judgment in the context of gst one has to so one may have to be quite quite circumspect and skeptical before rushing to the court challenging the socos notice is issued under the gst law by the gst authorities merely on the ground of it being in excess of monetary powers one may have to do their homework very properly no doubt on the sideline the question arises that if the board knows the position that their administrative direction may be flouted by the officers and otherwise the statute do not provide them to prescribe the monetary limit why does the board continue to do this or otherwise make it very clear legal uh, in a way that legally statutorily the officers can have to adhere to that particular monetary limits there has to be the department cannot have it both the ways in my personal respectful opinion the other important principle is socos notice is a condition precedent to a demand 
this is a well settled law from the by uh, since ages one of the most talwar, uh, important judgments on these are madhumilan syntax and gokak patel later on followed also in metal forging these are the three uh, tell telling judgments of the honorable supreme court no demand can be raised much less recovered from any taxpayer on any count whatsoever without issue of the socos notice in madhumilan gokak patel supreme court even said that a post facto demand will socos notice will not validate the demand that is what even supreme uh, supreme court said in gokak patel so any recovery during audit or during investigation or by the department jurisdictional authorities but without issuing the socos notice is a bad in law it is without authority of law it is a right of the ssc to ask for the proper socos notice even though he may actually accept the objection then whether he wants to go ahead with the litigation or not is a different matter but there is no authority in in this uh, uh, which can really enforce a demand during investigation similarly in the same breath a mere letter or communication asking for the payment is not a shocos notice friends i would here like to say one point every communication coming from the department should not be and is never a notice we have to be very clear about how do we describe or call or how do we call a particular what do we call a particular uh, notice uh, we have been listening even if the summons comes the taxpayer would call his consultant sir jara notice aaya hua hai even if a center letter simple letter or communication comes he will come ke sir notice aaya for him taxpayer it is understandable for him every single letter or communication from the department is a notice but the tax professionals cannot get into that it is it is it is on pitfalls and it is his own psychological issues or when we say notice it has to be under section 73 or 74 all other communications cannot be treated as a, or equated with notice it is in this context we have to again see if a, if a letter or communication comes from the departmental authority whatever may be the authority asking for the payment on any count or reversal of the itc then it is not a socos notice and it is not binding in law on the ssc he is not obliged in law to really he may give his explanation but he is not obliged in law to adhere to that uh, dictate and make the payment in fact in sidwell refrigeration case tribunal delhi has delhi bench said that a letter of superintendent communicating the audit observations with request to pay the duty is not a socos notice and it was also held by the tribunal that such letter is not a valid appealable order and no appeal can be filed against such letter and therefore if the audit objections and they are on the rise now under gst regime and it will only be rising in the coming days the audit objections seeking some compliance standard pay the tax or reverse the credit with interest and penalty the uh, taxpayer should and can report can respond to that but he need not if he does not agree particularly he is not obliged in law to make the payment in term period and therefore it is not a notice and these are the judgments on which this particular law has been laid down very well whether the socos notice should be in writing there are certain fundamental essentials uh, of the socos notice let us shortly deal with it uh, in uh, voltas case the it was held by the tribunal that the a socos notice under section 28 of the customs act or section 11a of the excise act has to be in writing uh, i mean a oral socos notice whereby the orally it is conveyed or by email something is conveyed that is not a socos notice a socos notice has to have the basic uh, details and stuck, uh, all the uh, uh, prerequisites as mandated in law and as mandated by various principles which we will be seeing is the oral socos notice valid can a socos notice be waived this particular question had arisen on in the in vargo steel case where supreme court in the peculiar case it was a case of the cust under customs relating to the seizure of the goods and in custom there is a provision where the importer or exporter in order to really uh, you know uh, cut short the lengthy process uh, he is given an opportunity to waive the socos notice and seek the release of the goods and also to put forward its case in case any demand has arisen however 
the no such provision existed in uh, one of the important judgment on this recently held in, uh, in the context of service tax is national cooperative bank limited where the service tax demand was actually honored by the bank uh, based on the objections raised by the audit later on they found that the whatever they have paid is much more higher than what should have been payable then they had even asked for the department had asked them to close the proceeding also company had not accepted that closure but they had made the entire payment which was found to be higher than what they were supposed to pay and then company challenged it that our liability is actually only about 7 to 8 lakhs resulting into excess payment of about 45 lakhs which they asked for the refund department said that you know you have voluntarily paid and you have asked for the closer and uh, there was no need for the socos notice because there was a closer high court did not agree to this contention of the revenue and they said that okay, when the company has not accepted the any oral communication is of no use and the socos notice has to be we must and the ruling went in favor of the bank so there is a circular of 1997 when board has even under the customs has actually clarified that ideally uh, when substantial questions of law are involved the socos notice should be always issued so that both the sides have a proper competent authority can get into the matter in a proper and meaningful manner and the waiver of the socos notice should not be encouraged a notice must contain all the details one of the most uh, Uh, important and the celebrity judgment it has been a guiding searchlight for all these years is of the supreme court in brindavan beverages in brindavan beverages the supreme court if i were to quote supreme court exact wording the court says the socos notice is the foundation on which the department has to build up its case friends let me repeat this the socos notice is a foundation on which the department has to build its case if the allegations in the socos notice are not specific and are on the contrary vague lack details and or unintelligible that is sufficient to hold that the notice notice was not given proper opportunity to meet the allegations indicated in the socos notice a socos notice cannot be vague allegations has to be very explicit and clear one of the cardinal principles of law is that the A, an SSE or the notice or a taxpayer cannot be expected to presume the case of the department. It has to be very clearly brought out in the SOCOS notice itself. And as a matter of fact, if a particular SOCOS notice is vague, uh, then instead of uh, going into the mind of the revenue officer, what he might have actually hinted, what he might have actually thought of, what he might have probably thought to allege. we are not required to undertake this type of exercise we have to specifically challenge the vagueness of the allegations by the reply one need not assume presume or get into the shoes of the revenue officer what he might have probably thought of and this similar views have been expressed by the tribunal mumbai in mehta pharmaceuticals and bikhalal dwarkadar friends these are all the fundamental principles of law which are equally good for the gst regime also one thing i would like to point out here is the fundamental concepts and for that matter the substantial provisions of the gst law are not uh, materially different from the rustwhile excise and service tax to some extent vague and now uh, currently a custom legislation at toll somehow other we are looking at the gst law with the you know with something as if it is something new it is not our eyesight is the same our eyes are the same probably we are wearing the glasses with the different colors and everybody is changing the color everybody has its own color to look at this law and this probably is also one of the major reasons that why the confusion and the conflict are arising in in the in day to day in this law and that's why i say these are the basic fundamental principles relating to socos notice which have been laid down in the context of the rustwhile indirect tax regime which will equally hold good even for the gst socos notice shall not be based on assumptions and presumption one of the most important case on this which have been holding field since last almost more than 40 years is of old sugar mill where the demand of clandestine removal on the basis of clandestine removal was 
raised by the department purely on the basis of assumption and presumption on the basis of some supposed products and company might would have undertaken and once the evasion and clandestine removal classes come to the fore under gst regime also all these judgment would also become quite important then should socos notice indicate the amount demanded yes uh, the socos notice must indicate the amount demanded here there are conflicting views and uh, the in bihari silk mill there is a larger bench decision of the tribunal it's a majority decision but larger bench decision where it was said that that socos notice issued without quantification of demand will also be still valid it was held that the word specified i am referring to this particular point because the language of section 73 and 73 uh, 74 1 uh, and the, the as well as 7310 and 7410 are pari materia with the language of the language of the views under section 11a of excise act and section 73 of the finance act 1994 relating to service tax and in the context of this the larger bench said that the word specified used in the uh, section is not same as the determined while there is an element of definitiveness in specifying an amount describing or stating in detail is the same as specifying the majority had relied upon hindustan aluminum case of delhi high court where however in jba printing in case madras high court single judge had said that a socos notice which does not quantify the demand is not valid this single judge judgment was distinguished by the delhi high court in hindustan aluminum and this was followed by the majority in the larger bench decision of bhari silk however in in again in gwalior rayon it was held by the high court that non mention of the necessary particulars in the notice is not a valid ground to issuing the socos notice in my personal opinion these judgments may come under the reconsideration or should come under reconsideration the ratio let down therein if we very carefully see section 73 1 and 74 1 it uses the same words that a proper officer may issue a notice to the taxpayer requiring him that is registered person requiring him to show cause as to why he should not pay the amount specified in the notice and then thereafter after adjudication process the amount is determined as payable by an order under 7310 or 7410 by the proper officer so and it is a, a well settled principle of law that ultimately whatever amount is determined as payable through the adjudication process by the proper officer cannot be in excess of the amount specified in the notice so unless the amount is specified in the notice it becomes like an open ended scheme which may not be correct so i personally feel the observations and the law laid down by the madras high court single judge in jba printing inc limited case is a proper law and so called notice needs to have a specific amount we may see some fireworks in the coming days maybe on this issue coming to a so called notice issued under the wrong provision is it valid by and large in all these judgments it is a law that merely mere issue of the so called notice under a wrong provision will not uh, invalidate the notice if the powers the allegation the power to raise that allegation can be traced to a particular provision in the law however in the context of the penalty in anupwire's case it was held by the uh, supreme court that if an sac is given a notice for a penal action under one clause which was not applicable and sac was not given an opportunity to meet the case in sustaining the penalty in another clause then it is not valid this is very important no penalty on a taxpayer can be imposed without first putting him on the notice and when there are multiple provisions applicable uh, as far as the penal action is concerned a citing of the wrong provision may be one thing but thereafter without affording an opportunity to the taxpayer if the penalty is, is basically imposed on him under another penal clause then that will not be valid so here there is a departure from the law that the wrong provision mere wrong provision will not invalidate the notice issue of corrigendum or addendum to socos notice at times one come across that the uh, authority who has issued a socos notice may also issue a corrigendum after a while or some addendum 
ओरिजेंडम फॉर करेक्टिंग सम मिस्टेक और एडंडम बाय एडिंग सर्टेन मटेरियल पार्टिकुलर्स इन द शोकोस नोटिस इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन समटाइम्स अराइजेस वेदर दिस ओरिजेंडम और एडंडम शैल बी ट्रीटेड एज अ फ्रेश शोकोस नोटिस और वेदर द लिमिटेशन पीरियड शुड बी कंप्यूटेड फ्रॉम द ओरिजिनल डेट ऑफ द ओरिजिनल नोटिस और फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ ओरिजेंडम इन स्टील अथॉरिटी इंडियास केस सुप्रीम कोर्ट सेड दैट द इट अपील द ट्रिब्यूनल ऑर्डर where the tribunal has held that a belated corrigendum issued to the socos notice for enlarging the scope of the first notice was made in law similarly if the corrigendum is merely to rectify some technical errors or minor errors uh, it will not be treated as a fresh notice however if the corrigendum or addendum substantially alter the character of the socos notice practically making out a new case or adding some allegations which substantially alter the nature of the entire case then it cannot be treated as a mere corrigendum or addendum and it may have to be treated as a fresh notice and the limitation will period will have to be recount considering the date of the corrigendum addendum these are certain principles and which applicability of which will depend on the facts of the each case whether the principle of res judicata applicable to socos notice res judicata is a latin term friends which is a thing which is already adjudged in the context of an adjudication it implies that a matter once adjudged and having attained finality cannot be reconsidered uh, there has to be an end to the process, litigation process department cannot uh, go on reopening the case on one pretext or another once they have decided a particular matter in the context of the particular uh, issue which they have raised then they cannot go on reopening that uh, particular issue which is settled suppose in favor of the sse uh, on another pretext and there the principle of res judicata may come into play in metal extruders case the bombay high court has said this principle would apply if a socos notice is issued on the same cause of action and for the same period on an issue is the same that is of the first socos notice then the socos notice will be uh, made in law on the principle of res judicata in siddhartha tips also the tribunal said that a second socos notice for a same period on different grounds cannot be issued after the matter has been adjudicated this is very interesting if a socos notice for a particular period is issued on a particular ground and if it is adjudged in favor of uh, the party or while it is pending suppose then also department then cannot issue a fresh socos notice for the same period on different grounds and this was the same view which was taken even in paro food products case in spintech limited case tribunal said that once the matter has been adjudicated second socos notice on the same set of facts and changing the stand is not sustainable even if tribunal had remanded the matter for re adjudication when the matter is remanded for fresh adjudication department cannot uh, really get into and create a new case because the remand Uh, order of the tribunal is binding on the department unless otherwise separately challenged and set aside so directions in the remand order department cannot go beyond the scope of those directions this is again an important aspect another very interesting issue at time arises is can a socos notice prejudge the issue in all these cases the supreme court high court uh, have held that that if the reading of the socos notice shows that the authority has already made up his mind and has already formed up his conclusion then the it will be like prejudging the issue and therefore giving an opportunity of representation to the taxpayer and giving an opportunity of hearing to him will be a futile will be only an empty formality in like sbq steel limited case api court noted that the socos notice has been frequently using the word it is clear it is clear it is clear from this it is clear from this this was treated as a uh, you know the practically arriving at the uh, premature judgment prejudging the issue by the high court and the proceedings were closed this is very important it will again depend upon the reading of the socos notice generally one would find the socos notice only says it therefore appears it therefore appears nowadays nobody makes this mistake of saying that it is very clear but this principle can be kept in mind the another important is uh, aspect and which is actually hurting everybody every now and then and that is validity of the amount recovered during 
investigation and consequential refund thereof. One of the most important cases recently decided by the Madras High Court in the Nandi Dal Mills Limited case. And we have quite a few judgments under the erstwhile regime, Dabur India, Vodafone. There are a catena of decisions. Ultimately, they are all in a way reaffirming the principle that no demand, no amount can be recovered, whatever may be the justification, no amount can be recovered from a taxpayer without following the due process of law and without issue of the SOCOS notice. Therefore, if any amount is recovered during investigation by force, though in the statement it will always come out that the taxpayer has paid it voluntarily, then also the validity of such recovery can always be challenged by the taxpayer. They can say that this was not voluntary or even though initially if they have willingly paid it, later on they realize that it was a mistake of law on their part to make this payment because it was never payable. This will again depend some of the facts of the each case. But the principle which we are actually talking about is that, that during investigation, if any amount is recovered by the department, it is actually lying in the nature of the deposit only. When the so called, if you see whether based on the audit objection followed by a SOCOS notice or a normal departmental investigation, when some amount is recovered, whether tax short paid or not paid or ITC reversal, when it is paid and the taxpayer has not actually agreed to that, there will be a SOCOS notice. That SOCOS notice will have two paragraphs in the end. Why this amount should not be recovered from the SSE and why the amount already deposited should not be appropriated against the amount demanded and determined as payable. If the amount paid by the taxpayer already stands uh, the credited in the coffer of the government, if it has already been recovered in the form of tax, though it might have been paid as a tax because it has to be paid under the uh, under the some category of tax, CGST, SGST. But if it is already paid as a tax, there was no question of any appropriation again. It means till that time it is only lying as a deposit in the hands of the government. And therefore, the it is the SSC's right to not only challenge this recovery, it is right to call for the SOCOS notice and even ask for the refund also. And here, these uh, principles let down. Nandi Daldil is a very important judgment, which is rendered in the context of GST law. And where, though it more or less the principles which have been discussed are the same for the uh, decades now, uh, the important thing for all the taxpayers and tax professionals really to take note of is this, that there is no compulsion, there is no obligation in law on part of the SSE to make the payment of tax during investigation if he does not agree. And there are enough safeguards which can be taken, which are also provided in law against such illegal recovery. Generally, a Stokos notice uh, will have a well-defined structure, which has been actually explained by this board master circular, though this circular basically is a uh, in the context of the excise and service tax, the more or less uh, it will have the relevance even under the GST regime. This is a good master circular issued by the board, embodying certain important principles which have already been laid down by the various court judgments. Uh, this circular is also available on the site. Uh, one should go through this. This circular can become quite relevant under GST. So generally, it will be introduction of the case, legal framework, Factual statement and appreciation of evidences like uh, statements recorded and other document uh, analyzed, document recovered. Then discussion, the analysis, and what are the conclusions drawn. And based on that, the allegations will be discussed. Then there will be, if there is an extended period of limitation, then the justification for actually invoking the extended period of limitation will also be discussed. Then calculation of duty and other amounts due. And finally, the authority to adjudicate there are last two paragraphs which will say why this amount should not be recovered along with interest, why penalty should not be imposed, and the SSC is hereby required to so cause to so and so, so and so within 30 days of the receipt of this notice. Uh, and if he fails to do so, file the reply within 30 days or does not appear for hearing, the case will be adjudicated on the basis of the records. And then last paragraph will be 
these notices issued without prejudice to any other action which may be taken under any other law for the time being in force. I'll come to this part also when we deal with the adjudication. Coming to pre-notice consultation, friends, in pre-notice consultation, the it is the outcome of the TARC recommendation. Dr. Parthas Sarthi shown the tax reform, uh, tax administration reform commission. They had made some very startling uh, recommendations, and one of the recommendations pertained to the pre-notice consultation, which was intended to avoid unnecessary litigation, whereby both the sides actually sit on the table and then they final whether seeing the justification in the allegation, if the SAC can also take a call whether to go ahead with the litigation or not. And if the, looking at the futility of the charge made by the department or proposed to be made by the department, the authority can also look into whether so called notice is required to be issued or not. This concept was actually implemented through board circular, not through the statutory provisions under the Rust file regime. However, in GST, it got the statutory recognition with the insertion of sub rule 1A in rule 142, wide notification number 49 by 2019, dated 9th October. And, and whereby DRC 01A was made mandatory to be issued before issue of any show cause notice under section 73 or 74. There are other provisions also. I'm only referring to these two. And this DRC 01A, though the uh, description is statement, it is basically it has a nature of the pre-notice consultation. And this was made mandatory because the word used was proper officer shall communicate this statement in form DRC 01A, whereby the SSE was thereafter given an opportunity either to uh, accept this entire thing and pay the money through DRC 03, or else he can make the part money payment, or he may even refuse to make any payment and then give the, his response in part two of DRC 01A. Then thereafter, in a, a very disturbing and unfortunate amen, uh, amendment on 15th October, merely after one year, the word shell has been actually replaced, substituted by word may. So now the provision of 1A re, uh, reads like proper officer may communicate. So he is now not under the legal obligation to issue the DRC 01A. Has it been made discretionary? And if it is made discretionary, then where is the need to keep this provision in the, first of all, in the statute book itself? Is it not really the mockery of the justice? In any case, the important question, serious question that arises here is whether this pre-notice consultation is really beneficial for the taxpayer or is it a trap for the taxpayers? That is the important question we have to ask. Uh, it is already touted, it has already been projected as a beneficial uh, provision. The, if one were to see that in pre-notice consultation, what happens is a communication will be sent to the party, having more or less all the ingredients of a show cause notice, that this is what the proposed allegations, allegations of the department and this is what the department proposes to do and raise the demand for an X amount. And however, uh, you are hereby uh, given an opportunity if through this pre-notice consultation to come forward and give your views. When an SSE in good faith uh, who sees the either the absurdity, futility or non-maintainability of the allegations in the pre-notice intimation goes fully armed with all the submissions, almost in every case happens is these submissions are ultimately invariably rejected by the authority. And then follows a proper, uh, the regular SOCOS notice in terms of the provisions of section 73, 74. This is exactly what was happening under the Rustwile Excise Service Tax and Customs. And this SOCOS notice, which is a regular SOCOS notice as per the statute, will narrate the whole history of how the pre-notice consultation was undertaken, how the charges were communicated to the party, what are the party's submissions. And if the taxpayer is lucky, they, he may even give, the authority may even give the reasons for not accepting the, the uh, submissions made by the party. Uh, otherwise though, submissions have been gone into, I have considered carefully and I do not find them acceptable, I therefore reject. And then it says 
Therefore, you are hereby required to show cause again as to why the amount should not be recovered from you. Now, friends, please see the whole absurdity and futility of this exercise. The earlier pre-notice consultation related intimation practically dons the character of the show cause notice, giving all the uh, explaining all the allegations against which that party has already filed a detailed reply, which has already been rejected by the officer. And again, the so-called notice is merely practically the replica of the pre-notice consultation intimation. Now, what will remain with the with the SSE in his, uh, you know, arm chest? What he is going to defend himself with? And therefore, what actually TAR committee had actually proposed and, uh, you know, recommended with whatever may be the, uh, you know, the noble objective at the grassroots level, at the implementation level, it turns out to be more often than not a trap for the SSE. Because the SSE has already exposed his defense at the pre-notice consultation stage to the, to the department. Now, department having fully aware of what is going to be the line of defense of the SSE knows how to take forward the further proceedings in this regard. Personally, the way manner in which such pre-notice consultation are carried out, I am personally dead against this entire process at all. It is better this pre-notice consultation process is completely done away with and it is omitted from the statute book. It is better for the taxpayers, uh, whatever may be the contrary claims. And having said that, in all these judgments, it has been held that pre-notice consultation, if it is not adhered to the board circular under the rust file regime, if they are not adhered to, then the, uh, the subsequent so-called notice will become invalid. At least this is some secure given by the uh, High Court. Uh, Bake Office, Novel Security Service, and Omex New Chandigarh, the latest case, these are all on the same line and they are in the context of GST. The other judgments are also in the, are in the context of excise or customs or service tax. But uh, one word of caution again, I would reiterate my personal view on this, that pre-notice consultation should be, if at all somebody is eager to participate in pre-notice consultation, one has to be extremely careful and skeptical uh, with the pitfalls of going into such type of pre-notice consultation process being clearly understood. Personally, I never encourage Mike, uh, you know, to participate in such type of pre-notice consultation. Then comes the limitation period. Uh, the, there are two provisions, uh, section 73 and section 74. We have seen that 73 one speaks about, both the sections speaks about the issue of a so cause notice by a proper officer in case he observes that there has been a short payment of tax or non payment of tax or the refund erroneously granted or ITC wrongly availed or wrongly utilized by a registered person. And in that case, he can issue a so cause notice to the such person and along with the so cause as to why interest also should not be recovered from him under section 50. Both the provisions obviously provide for the limitation period within which the so cause notice has to be issued. In the uh, colloquial language, I would say, which is section 73 provides for the normal period of limitation and section 74 provides for the extended period of limitation. In normal period of limitation is when there is an absence of fraud or willful misstatement or suppression of facts with intent to evade payment of tax. Whereas in case of 74, when such elements are, any of these elements is present, fraud or willful misstatement or suppression of facts with intent to evade payment of tax, then the extended period of limitation will be applicable. It shall be noticed, I have already dealt with this, but in fact, 73 uses the word shell. So is section 74 one also that shall issue a so-called notice. It means before any recovery, so-called notice is mandatory. Then it should also specify the amount of tax or ITC proposed to be recovered. Proposal to recover the interest under section 50 and notice should also propose though section 73 one and 74 one does not speak about that. Notice must invariably so as to the clause under which the penalty is proposed because without notifying that, 
a penalty cannot be imposed on a party. Time limit which is prescribed in case of 73.2 is notice under subsection 1 shall be issued at least three months prior to the time specified in subsection 10 for issuance of order. And in other words, the time limit under 73.2 which is prescribed is linked to the time limit prescribed for the passing of the order, adjudication order by the authority. And what is that time limit? 73.10 says the proper officer shall issue the order under subsection 9, that is after considering the representations made by the party within three years from the due date for furnishing of annual return for the financial year for, to which the demand or erroneous refund relates. So the time limit for passing an adjudication order is three years from the due date of furnishing annual return for the relevant financial year. And it is keeping these three years in mind, a normal period of limitation prescribed is three months prior to these three years. In other words, a show cause notice has to be issued within the, the within three, 33 months by the proper officer. This period is extended under 7410. Through a table, I have explained this. Relevant financial year to which support demand relates is 1718. The due date for furnishing the AR, and when I said due date, I am also talking about the extended due date. The extended due date for furnishing the annual return goes 5 to 2020 for category A states and 7 to 2020 for the category 2 states. From here, the time limit shall be reckoned in terms of 73.2 read with 73.10, which is at least three months prior to that. So the authority can now issue the notice uh, uh, within 33 months of 5 to 2020, which will expire on 5 11 2022. In other words, any demand relating to 2017-18 can be raised by the proper officer before 5-11-2022. That is still more than one year available to him for raising the demand of 17-18. For 18-19, he has got time up to September 23, 30th September. For raising the demand for 19-20, he has got a time limit up to 21-12-2023. This is all, sorry, it should be 31-12. I'm sorry, there is a typographical error. Uh, and this is because the time limit is required to be computed from the uh, due date of furnishing the return. Now, what is the period under extended period of limitation? If any of the elements like fraud or willful misstatement or suppression of facts with intent to evade tax or take the wrong uh, ITC or wrongly utilize the ITC is present. In that case, the proper officer can serve the notice, should serve the notice at least six months prior to the time limit specified under subsection 10. And 7410 speaks about the passing of the adjudication order within a period of five years from the due date for furnishing of Indian rule. So what will be the time limit if there is a suppression or evasion? We call it evasion cases. In case of evasion, the time limit under 74 will be for 1718, it will be August 24. For 1819, it will be June 25. And for 1920, it will be September 25. Friends, appears to be the very, very long rope way given to the rope given to the departmental officers. There are two reasons for this. This time limit of three years and five years uh, more or less have been continuing from excise and service tax. Initially in excise, it was six months. It became one year and then it became two years. In service tax, it started with one year. Then it became two years and then 30 months. Now, the obviously, the departmental officer busy as they are so much. So they have a lot many things, other things to do may not get too much time to really issue the notice in time. So obviously the uh, board has come to their rescue by extending the time limit for issue of the so-called notice time and again. Fortunately, the evasion cases where there are evasion uh, alleged, the extended period of limitation has remained static at five years during all this period. That is the only saving grace for the taxpayers. 
though the normal period of limitation has always been extended one hour from time to time but extended period of limitation has remained 5 years however what has happened under gst regime is the concept of relevant date has been widely buried if you read section 11a of excise act or 73 of finance act 1994 the time limit of 30 months or 2 years or 2 years or 30 months or 5 years was required to be recorded from the relevant date the relevant date itself has been defined under the section generally it is the date of filing of the return and in case the return is not filed then the due date on which the return is required to be filed so in case of excise it was generally quarterly return or monthly return in case of service tax it was a six monthly return so effectively in service tax though it was 30 months the authority was getting 37 months uh, for raising the demand because the returns were half month uh, half yearly but that is fine but it was always linked to the date of filing the return or due date of filing the return here the time limit has been linked to the last date for the issuance of the order this is the legacy from the wet regime this was never a practice in excise and service tax for all these decades this is the legacy from the wet regime and it has serious repercussions for the taxpayers because of the extraordinarily long period of time which the department gets on account of this proposition another serious matter here is because the notice is required to be issued issued by the officer at least 3 months or 6 months prior to the period prescribed 3 years or 5 years for the passing of the order nothing stops the officer from issuing the so called notice at the 11th hour this was happening in wet this can happen even under gst nothing will stop him from issuing the notice just before the period of 33 months getting expired and then he has to pass an order within the 3 years for normal case or 5 years within the evasion case he will have hardly 3 months or 6 months to adjudicate the matter without following and in the haste and putting the you know in a very very mechanical manner the orders are likely to be passed this has been happening in wet this can happen even under gst i have no doubts about that another important thing is that why there should be now linkage to the annual return here something the tax authority uh, our tax professional bodies and tax payers bodies can also take up the matter when we are on digital everything is available on the screen of the officers any officer sitting across anywhere in the country can look at the overall the activities and the transactions of the authority of, of the tax payer why should there be this time limit of 3 year forget about extended period so giving some benefit of doubt but why should there be a time limit of such a long period of 3 years as a normal period of limitation where is the need first of all it should be delinked from the annual return it should be linked to the gstr 1 only number 1 and secondly the time limit should be ideally brought it down to one year only there has to be some serious uh, representation on this aspect from the professional bodies and the trade industry bodies as i personally feel and the last part the unusually long period which is right now also available to the officer for raising the demand for the years which have gone by 17 18 18 19 and 19 20 uh, and now obviously 20 21 will also come Uh, is probably the is because of the repeated extension granted for the furnishing of the gstr 9 while seeking the extension for filing the gstr 9 due to normally because of the due, uh, technical glitches and now in last two years because of the covid related covid induced situation justification i am not against the justification why are we seeking the extension of due date for furnishing the gstr 9 why can't we say that you do not extend the due date for furnishing annual return but you waive the late fee and penalty for uh, uh, by prescribing a particular date by which if the ar is filed your due date remains the same but your late fee and penalty is waived once the due date is uh, actually frozen on say 31st december of the next financial year 
then at least the time limit for issue of the SOCOS notice will also get frozen. The unusual long period which is gone away, which has made, which has been made available, is probably is our own doing. When we went on asking for the extension of the due date for furnishing the AR, we may have to be extremely careful. I am sorry to say, uh, I was I've been always dead again. I have written in my articles in Text India Online on this that by seeking the extension of annual return filing date, we are inviting only the problems and problems for us. Today, a normal taxpayer having a turnover of 50 lakh or one year, one crore, and it can even include the professional fraternity also. The individual professional having a income of a gross income of 50 lakh, one year, one crore, two crore also can have a hanging sword of the SOCOS notice for first year of implementation, 17, 18, right up to November 22. Is it really desirable uh, situation to be in? I hope that henceforth, we will be much more careful in seeking the extension of due date for furnishing the annual return. Then service of notice. There are different modes of services which have been provided under section 169. The important point is whether the modes of services prescribed under section 169 are alternative or are to be followed sequentially. My personal view and going, I'm not going into too much detail on this, but going by the ratio of the principal laid down in the Rustwile excise service tax and custom regime also, which is in present in vogue, uh, the modes of services prescribed are to be followed sequentially and not alternative, though the language has been kept very beautifully vague. There could be some legal disputes on this uh, aspect also in the coming days, because section 169 has been couched in a very, very devilish language. Statement of demand. The statement of demand comes when there is a frequent uh, notice is to be issued for the subsequent period. This practice was introduced in excise and service tax few years back and has been continued under GST, whereby the officer need not really narrate the whole story again in the SOCOS notice to be issued for the uh, subsequent period when there is a recurring effect of a particular dispute. And this is all right. I mean, this is just to save the time, energy and paper. So he can simply issue a statement of demand tabulate in a tabulated form and simply say that this notice is based on the same grounds and uh, or basis on which the earlier SOCOS notice for the earlier period has been issued. What is important is the statement of demand when it is issued for the subsequent period, the questions of allegation of fraud, willful suppression is not permissible to be raised. Because once the facts are within the knowledge of the department, then Based on the same facts, department cannot go on uh, alleging the willful uh, the evasion and willful suppression again and again and issue the SOCOS notice. This principle has been firmly laid down in the Nizam Sukar case. We will see about this uh, judgment by the Supreme Court. This principle has been embodied in the statement of demand related provision. And therefore, there cannot be an allegation of evasion in the statement of demand for the subsequent period. And if the department has missed the board, for issuing the demand for the subsequent period, it cannot then, uh, you know, they revive the issue by alleging evasion against the party unless there is a conclusive material to support the allegation. And therefore, no penalty will be really, penal action can lie when in case of a demand raised to the statement of demand. Friends, then we will take up the extended period of limitation and certain important principles of law. Uh, it is 532. We will take only a five minute comfort break. Uh, I'm comfortable, but uh, I will just give a five minute break and I will rejoin. Uh, I think, shall we, Navinji? Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Shall we take the break or what do, what do you want me to do? Uh, sir, we can take the break for almost five minutes. Five minutes, na? Okay. Sure, sir. I, I'll just leave the screen as it is. We'll take the break over. Okay, okay, sure. sure. Okay. Thank you very much.
Hello. 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 Just number three, I'll suffer. Can you just see it? Where are we? Switch to okay. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Shall I start? Yeah, sure, sir. You can. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was just uh, waiting. Hmm. So, friends, uh, yeah, we now entered the second session. Uh, as I said, section 73 provides for the prescribes a normal period of limitation for issue of the so-called notice when the elements like a fraud or willful misstatement 
or suppression of tax with intent to evade payment of tax is uh, absent. However, when any of this element is present, the department gets an extended period of, to issue the show cause notice, for, and that the computation of that period of about five years we have already seen into. What is really interesting is if you see very carefully the Rust file section 11A of Excise and section 73 of the Finance Act and even the current section 28 of the Customs Act, it not only uses the three elements of fraud, willful misstatement or willful suppression, but it also uses two other expressions, willful misdeclaration and collusion. These two words, willful misdeclaration and collusion, are actually absent and they are actually conspicuous by their absence in the current regime. Very interesting. Probably willful misdeclaration may have to be thought uh, as covered under misstatement. And collusion, I'm always wondering okay, why the collusion has been actually uh, omitted from the current dispense, in the current dispensation. Generally, the collusion, there are, there are a few very rare cases where the demand uh, charges of evasion are based on collusion. Generally, the collusion is between the departmental officers and the taxpayers or the defaulters. And I don't know what could be the reason for removing collusion. It is uh, your guess is you know, as good as mine. So fine, we'll proceed. Fraud. The meaning of the fraud is that fraud basically contains an element of uh, intention. One need not prove the intention in fraud. Because the fraud itself signifies the intentional act or uh, not to act on part of the party. Tax fraud and in the cosmic dichemical, these are the celebrity, these are all the judgments which I would be citing henceforth are the judgments uh, which have time and again explained all these uh, different, different expressions like fraud or the willful suppression or even willful misdeclaration and collusion. In cosmic dike chemical, the Supreme Court says fraud and collusion are concerned. It is evident that the intent to evade duty is built into these very words. So one need not prove, department need not prove, fraud vitiates everything. So one need not prove that. Then again, these are the judgments on which willful misstatement or suppression of facts have been explained in detail by the Supreme Court. These are all the judgments which laid down certain basic fundamental provisions, provisions of law. And I'll just take up uh, in the coming slides. Uh, I'm just citing these judgments. Like, if we see certain established principles of law in this regard, is mere inaction or failure a suppression of fact? In Padmini products, the tax liability, duty liability was not discharged uh, on the agarbattis which were being manufactured by the household ladies. And the case of the department was that okay, there was a willful suppression in suppressing this activity of the agarbati, which was an excisable product. The Supreme Court actually did not agree to this proposition that a mere suppression of facts, a non-declaration is not sufficient to invoke the larger period of limitation, but some more positive act is required. It was further held by the Supreme Court that a mere failure or negligence on part of the manufacturer to take license or pay duty in the cases where there was a scope for doubt as to whether the goods were dutiable or not cannot attract the extended period of limitation. The law laid down in Padmini products, somewhat similar proposition laid down by the Supreme Court in Kempfar Drugs and Liniments case, 8940, I'll come to that judgment as well, that uh, whether there is a fraud or not is a merely a, is a essentially a question of fact. And this has to be an established if there is a positive aid. Non-declaration of something in the return is not suppression if there is no deliberate withholding of the information. And this has been laid down and followed. So coming back to the next principle, whether the extended period of limitation is invocable if a person has acted or may not have acted, but in bona fide and in good faith, the answer is no. If it can be proved that person has not acted malafide or with an intent to evade payment of tax, or duty, whatever you call it, then applying the ratio of the principle let down under Padmini products, Univert, and host of other judgments, the extended period cannot be allowed to be invoked on the charge of willful suppression. Because the word use is willful. The word willful or deliberate or intentional 
has been uh, elaborately dealt with and explained by the Supreme Court in all these judgments. The catch word is the willful. And therefore, Supreme Court says that the mere suppression is not sufficient to invite uh, the extended period of limitation. It should be willful. Here, there is one catch. Uh, there is a difference between the bona fide belief and the blind belief. So one has to be clear. Every time something where the SSE has failed to do something, uh, it does not become a bona fide belief. The onus will lie on the SSE to prove that he had actually acted bona fide or actually failed to act bona fide under some misunderstanding, uh, mistaken belief of law. Will not non supply of information not mandated under the statute amount to suppression of facts? Suppose a statute does not require a particular information uh, to be supplied to the department. And if that information is not supplied by the department, SSE, because it is not required under the statute, and based on that, if the department alleges willful suppression, can the extended period of limitation be invoked? The answer is no. This has been a settled law. Fortunately, under explanation 2 to section 74 of the CGST Act, this principle has now been clearly embodied that if, the, if there is statute does not require particular information to be supplied, then the non-supply thereof will not amount to suppression. That is the meaning of this explanation. This is a very important and uh, welcome development. Can the suppression be alleged if all material facts are disclosed? There are n number of judgments which says that when all the material facts are disclosed by the party through the returns or through the correspondence, then the suppression cannot be alleged. Friends, indirect tax, particularly excise, service tax, or even customs and now GST, they remain complex piece of legislation. The one thing which the taxpayer actually cannot afford to do is to take the things for granted. When in doubt, write to the department, that is the motto I follow. Nothing to take for granted. It, there is no necessity to ask for the approval or the view of the department. One should never do that. At least I never do that. Never, never ask for the approval of the department to what you are doing. Never ask for the view of the department if there is a doubt. Put forward your doubts. Put forward your sorry, views, what you have concluded, what you intend to do. Suppose there is an issue regarding the classification under the competing entries or inclusion of a particular element in the taxable value or entitlement to the exemption notification. For that matter, even entitlement to the ITC on a particular uh, inverse supply of service or goods. In all these cases, once an informed decision is taken by the party, but there is a possibility of the dispute because the department may take a contra view, the one thing which the least one can do is declare everything through in whatever manner, if necessary, to write to the department. The standard advice which is given and the standard practice which is being followed in majority of the cases by the taxpayers is that that why to wake them up by telling them something. They are always uh, in an alert stage. The presumption should be department knows everything. It is only the question of when they decide to come and knock at your door. And the one thing which probably the taxpayer can avoid and tax professional for their clients can avoid is allowing the department to invoke the extended period of limitation. Whatever may be the consequences, but the department should be made aware of if there are disputed questions of law on which there could arise the dispute uh, demand also, where the party has taken a particular stand. In what manner, in what facts would be disclosed, that's a different matter. It's a facts to uh, case to case. But one should never take things for granted. Put the ball in the department's court. This is the game one should really be master at. It is a long tennis game. How effectively and strategically, one can put the ball in the department opponent's uh, court. That will decide the fate uh, in future. Because even if the department does not respond to your communication, they cannot invoke the extended period because the facts have been disclosed. And uh, invocation of normal period of limitation for the demand, even if after department has not acted, or department might have actually agreed to your view, that is the risk, that is a business risk where the assessment may get reopened. That's a different matter. 
mere claiming wrong classification or wrong exemption cannot be considered a willful suppression or misstatement of facts these are some self, again very important judgments of the supreme court mere claiming of wrong classification or wrong exemption does not become suppression much less willful suppression if all the material facts are disclosed in the document then it does not become the wrong and that's why i will always wondered that why the case about the hand sanitizer classification issue was made out to be the evasion case the hand sanitizer after the outbreak of the covid you will all be aware of that dgci had swung into extant seized the goods and then they had raised the demand by charging the party with the evasion of evasion of the tax amount of 6% they were clear at 12% and they were actually uh, held to be liable to be at 18% they were considered to be liable assuming it is liable to 18% under a different tariff entry how can there be a suppression i wonder when the goods are cleared under the body, under the cover of tax invoice they are declared in the gstr1 they are tax paid tax is paid through gstr 3b there is no allegation about any camouflaging or manipulating the description nothing then how can there be merely because the wrong classification is uh, claimed as per the department how can there be a evasion charges inviting 100% penalty i have always wondered and for that matter i always wonder that in every single case why are the department be allowed why is the department being allowed to invoke section 74 when the goods are seized on the way in transit because of some differences in the eva bill visa vis the tax invoice or some discrepancy in the tax invoice where otherwise the genuine the transaction is genuine the active the, the delivery consignment is uh, uh, there i am not talking about bogus invoices i am talking about the where there are umpteen number of cases which are being booked daily by the department across the country mainly state authorities because of the perceived differences in the eva bill visa vis the even there is a expiry of the eva bill how can it become a case of section 74 i really wonder and why why are we succumbing to the payment of tax with interest and 15% penalty penalty in this type of cases if the amount is meager and the tax payer has no presence in the other state where the goods have been seized in the transit by the department one can still ask for the so called notice and order if this is not feasible then even if the payment is made one should immediately challenge this by way of an appeal in the given case and if the variation or discrepancies are only purely of technical nature we are allowing the department in the gst i have been very closely observing invoking section 74 in each and every case as if section 73 is not in existence at all when the normal period of limitation under section 73 for 17 18 has not yet expired it is getting expired on 5 11 2022 how can the department be allowed to invoke the extended period provision of section 74 in each and every case i really really wonder it is serious repercussions also i am not saying that there cannot be an evasion even yesterday there is no compartmentalization between 73 and 74 evasion charges can be sustained by the department even in case of yesterday's transaction it need not be extended period but there should be a conclusive material to support that and in almost all cases Uh, the department is invoking 74 and we are succumbing and surrendering ourselves to that invocation illegal invocation can demand be raised beyond extended period even if there is a fraud or willful misstatement or misdeclaration which is proved then also the demand cannot lie beyond 5 years at all the hands of the department are tied there this are the judgment can the extended period be invoked if the penalties are dropped if in a given case the authority drops the penalty and under section 12021 it is my personal view that all the 21 eventualities or situation enumerated under section 12021 uh, prescribing for the penalty equivalent to the tax are involving the evasion cases normal cases the penalty will lie under section 12022 now if the penalties where 12021 penalties are not imposed or if they are imposed and drop department cannot simultaneously still sustain the extended period invocation on the ground of willful suppression it will be contradictory department cannot on one hand drop the penalty and on the other hand still sustain allege and sustain 
the or seeks to sustain the allegations of suppression of it and extended period invocation these are the judgment where this ratio of the principal has been laid down then can the suppression of x be alleged in the second so uh, subsequent so called notice the most important judgment obviously it started with ec industries pnb pharmaceutical hyderabad polymers and then in nizam sugar the supreme court has further explained it and uh, elaborated it in all these cases it has been laid down when all the facts were within the knowledge of the department when the first so called notice was issued the allegations of willful suppression and invocation of extended period in the second so called notice is not permissible in law only in chatriya dehydrate case it is a recent case where the amdavad tribunal on the facts found that party had deliberately actually suppressed or actually misdeclared certain facts preventing the department from the issue of the so called notice for the subsequent period in time and the charges of willful suppression were upheld in this case is ignorance of law an excuse this is again a, uh, you know the uh, jurisprudential uh, you know principle there has been a debate and debate on this i would only say this is a subject by itself but i would only say that okay, is, has there been ever a law okay, ignorance of law is not an excuse friends in peter and miller tribunal said that if non payment was done due to ignorance of law larger period is not invocable and penalty is not sustainable in d kavas d case supreme court has actually very old case supreme court has actually said as a matter of fact there are judgments uh, including the uh, padampath sugar motilal padampath sugar mills case and uh, the in all these cases it has been laid down that uh, you know the uh, one is not expected to know each and every law and provision so this again can become a quite a debatable issue there is no final concluding ruling on this but it is too easy to really accept the proposition uh, or maybe too difficult to accept the proposition that ignorance of law is not an excuse one can still plead the ignorance of law in complying with the law particularly when law like gst is undergoing ma uh, massive and frequent amendments ignorance of law can become an handy argument in the given case can the extended period of limitation be invoked if the income facts are declared in the balance sheet in almost all judgments particularly in the context of the listed entity it has been laid down that such the balance sheet are the public document in the domain of the public domain it is in the public domain and therefore if the department demand is entirely based on the facts and income and transaction declared in the balance sheet returns and other records then extended period of limitation cannot be invoked this is the latest judgment are two on this line s creative learning private limited where this view has been actually taken also while deciding the in favor in merits also in favor of the party however in icici econet internet case this is another very important and very very uh, uh, you know significant judgment recently delivered by the bangalore bench of the tribunal and where the uh, it was in the context of service tax where icici econet which has actually established the trust for the uh, but which was actually turned out to be like a venture capital fund it was held to be liable under banking and other financial services there were about more than 30 appeals in this case of the same company or group companies is a, a very detailed judgment in this case bangalore tribunal has also said bangalore bench that merely because all the facts and income are declared in the balance sheet does not mean that department is privy to or aware of all these material facts and based on that extended period cannot be invoked the uh, uh, party has never informed the department what they have been doing and how the transactions have been carried out how the contractual arrangement was undertaken with the asset management companies which were also group companies how the substantial amount of performance fees or management fees were being paid by the company by the bank all these aspects were never declared therefore merely because the demand is based on the balance sheet it cannot be presumed that there was no suppression so one has to really be very careful while following up on this argument those majority of the view is that uh, particularly in the context of the listed companies that the, they are in public domain and therefore the extended period may not be invocable in such cases if there is a retrospective amendment of law then extended period certainly cannot be invoked it is a well settled law right from supreme court in jk cotton mills then again when there are conflicting views or judgments 
is it permissible to invoke the extended period? The answer is strictly no. There are umpteen number of cases where the matter reaches the uh, Supreme Court on a given case. Like even I would case, take the case of the doctrine of mutuality applicability to GST. Ultimately, in the context of service tax and wet, it had reached the Supreme Court. Then there are judgment on the uh, foreclosure charges, which are charged by the bank on which the repo home finance larger bank decision came, that it is a condition for the contract, cannot be said to be the consideration for the contract. So liquidated damages, foreclosure, these are certain issues. Admissibility of the ITC uh, uh, in terms of 17.5 C and D, safari retreat. These are the potential issues where the belated invocation of the extended period of limitation uh, can become a subject matter of challenge, applying the principle let down in this law. Uh, there are quite a few issues where there are different high courts have given the different rulings. Uh, one may have to keep a note of this, keep the track of this, because if the ultimately if it is decided in favor of the revenue say by Supreme Court, when there are conflicting decisions of the High Court, like levy of GST on ocean trade or levy of service tax on the ocean trade, then these are the issues which are actually where department if might have missed the raising of the demand against the particular uh, taxpayer, they cannot subsequently post Supreme Court judgment in their favor invoke the extended period of limitation. Uh, in this non-deposit of tax by the supplier, extended period cannot be invoked against the buyer. This is one straight judgment, but interesting judgment in LG Electronics case. Then, principle of revenue neutrality. Revenue neutrality, friends, I will on this, uh, because I have to cover the appeals also. The law of revenue neutrality will mean that if I would have paid the tax which is now being demanded from me, then other party would have taken the ITC and therefore I cannot be charged with the willful suppression. This is how the revenue neutrality argument generally goes. In the olden days, initially this argument found favor with the courts and tribunal. However, then there was a dilution of this argument and it has been let down that merely because other party can get the credit, that cannot be the ground for the department to say uh, uh, for the uh, taxpayer to say that uh, there was no suppression on his part. Uh, and however, if it is available, credit is available to its own unit in excise, when the goods are removed by unit A to unit B, uh, which is meant for captive consumption, so to say, within the unit, it might be situated when there is a removal, excise was never on sale, excise was on removal. So if the duty is not paid, but if duty would have been paid, then other unit would have taken the credit in this context, which is under the uh, character of credit consumption, this principle has been upheld. However, in Mahindra Mahindra, even applicability of this principle in the context of captive consumption qua units of the same unit company has also been doubted and the matter is pending. But as of now, the law is that, that the credit would have been available to the SSE himself or his unit, then suppression cannot be alleged. The same principle applies even under reverse charge. There are judgments under reverse charge where the tax which is not paid, suppose service tax is not paid on ocean freight or ITC uh, tax is GST is not paid on the ocean freight. It is not payable, that's a different matter. I'm very firm in my view. Neither service tax is payable on ocean freight nor GST is payable. Assuming it is payable and not paid, there cannot be a willful suppression because I would have paid the tax by case and taken the ITC. However, in the context of ICIC Econet, the recent judgment, this revenue trade principle was also contended by the, on behalf of the appellant. And the, in the facts of this case, this argument was negatived by the tribunal. Please note that. In all cases of uh, extended period of limitation, the initial burden always lies on the department to establish the, uh, the fraud or willful statement, uh, misstatement or willful suppression of facts. And initial burden lies always on the department. This is the settled principle of law. It is once the, uh, the department actually uh, establishes that prima facie there is a case of willful suppression by leading the evidence on record, the burden will shift to the taxpayer or SSE or the notice to counter those charges. The, when we talk about, to sum up on this aspect, when we talk about is that if the uh, a suppression is something which a party is required in law to declare in law is 
to oblige the law to declare to the depa department which which does not declare it a mis declaration is something where a party either uh, gives the untrue declaration or uh, uh, disclose something which is untrue or incomplete one is a case of uh, omission to do an act which is suppression another is a case of doing an act but in a uh, you know uh, incomplete manner or untrue uh, wrong manner in all these cases the omission to do an act or doing an act should be driven by the intent to evade payment of tax and the burden lies on the department then coming to the conclusion and closure of the proceeding friends these are mainly patent on the rustwell provision of section 11a and section 73 uh, of the finance act in case of normal period of limitation which is invocable party has been given an opportunity to close the case by making the payment of tax with interest before issue of the sofos notice or within 30 days of the issue of the sofos notice and uh, then there will not be any penalty and the proceedings will be deemed to be concluded however if it is paid after the uh, in case of 74 there are three stages if it is paid prior to that is extended period of limitation if it is paid prior to sofos notice during investigation or on their own ascertainment or the within 30 uh, prior to then it is 15% penalty along with tax and interest if it is paid within 30 days of the sofos notice then it will be 25% penalty if it is paid within 30 days after adjudication order then it will be 50% penalty what is important to note down is this okay once the sofos notice is issued though there is a deeming provision of conclusion uh, then uh, the proceedings the protection under the section 122 125 129 and 130 this all proceeding in the uh, that is section 132 proceeding will not get protected prosecution related proceeding will not get collect, uh, actually protected so if a so cause not particularly in section 74 cases if the so cause notice is, is already issued and within 30 days or after adjudication within 30 days party concludes the case by making the payment of tax interest along with 25% penalty or 50% penalty then the protect uh, the proceedings under section 132 can still lie that should be kept in mind and another important judgment of bombay high court in viraj alloys in the context of excise was that that if the 30 days time limit suppose before so cause notice the amount is not paid so cause notice is issued party now wants to close the case if the amount of tax and interest is not paid within 30 days of the receipt of the notice then this protection will not be available there was a marginal delay in viraj alloys case but bombay high court strictly interpreted this 30 days time limit please keep it in mind then general provisions relating to determination of tax there are certain well settled principles of law laid down by the judicial pronouncement which have fortunately now become part of the section 75 i will just refer to certain important one couple of one ones the where extended period of limitation is invoked by issue of the so cause notice under section 74 for 5 years however ultimately tribunal or high court or supreme court holds that limit uh, the demand is time barred extended period cannot be invoked even though the demand is valid on merit in that case uh, the provision says that it should be held valid for the uh, normal period of limitation merely because the demand is held held is time barred for the period beyond the normal period of limitation it cannot survive for the normal period that law will not apply and that is been made now clear what is important in this case is whether the penalty which is 10% of the tax amount which is generally prescribed uh, imposed by the authorities under section 73 cases can it be imposed original demand is for extended period of 5 years tribunal suppose holds that on merit department is right but extended period cannot be invoked so we restrict the demand to the normal period fair enough however for normal period once it is actually restricted can the penalty be imposed 
this issue can become can raise his head sometime in my opinion no penalty can be imposed once the demand is held to be time barred for the extended period even though it is sustainable for the normal period in hmm supreme court says coercing and coercing supreme court says that once the demand is held to be time barred the penalty will not lie in my opinion the principle will be applicable the when any hearing to be granted where a request is received these are all natural justice violation then not more than three adjournments order to set out the relevant facts i will come to on the not more than three adjournment when i deal with the adjudication then interest payable irrespective whether or not specified in the order the liability to pay the interest arises under section 50 sub section 1 and for itc wrongly availed or taken it arises uh, utilized it arises under 53 uh, since this point has come i will only say this much in my firm view my personal view the liability to pay interest under section 50 sub section 3 on itc wrongly availed or utilized arises only when there is a mismatch in terms of section 42 or 43 if the itc is wrongly availed based on the interpretation bona fide misinterpretation of law or even on something uh, which is excluded under section 175 but based on the misunderstanding or misreading of the provision then in that case interest liability cannot arise under section 50 sub section 3 that is my view it applies because of the very very shabby and bad language used under 50 sub section 3 my view is that interest liability does not arise except if there is a mismatch and uh, this view has also found as of now uh, support can be held from the the patna high court judgment in the commercial sales corporation case as far as section 50 sub section 1 is concerned my view is that that even if there is a, a actual confirmed delayed payment of tax uh, which has been not paid or short paid no interest liability arises under section 50 sub section 1 because of this requires a harmonious and conjoint reading of many provisions but this view can be taken generally interest liability cannot be challenged uh, because it is automatic and i mean nobody can challenge it however for the first time a situation unfortunately has arisen whereby interest liability under section 50 sub section 1 can also be challenged even in cases where there is a delayed payment of tax and the last point is if the interest uh, itc wrongly taken assuming it is uh, reversible but not utilized whether interest liability can arise uh, here this issue will be will remain boiling no doubt there is a inship laboratories case of supreme court in the context of uh, rustwell sandwich credit where the word or used in rule 14 prior to as in existence prior to 2010 was actually interpreted by the supreme court to say that the uh, or is or and therefore even if it is wrongly availed but not utilized interest liability would still arise it was a case of bogus credit now there after 2012 rule 14 was amended by the board fortunately whereby liability of interest was restricted only if the wrongly availed credit is wrongly utilized and then it was actually demarcated into two sub rules by 2015 amendment section 731 and section 733 clearly uses the word or itc wrongly availed or utilized so the prima facie the in sweep laboratory ratio may apply fortunately very recently the high court has in a, uh, this commercial sales corporation case has uh, uh, sorry the earlier citation was slightly wrong i beg your pardon in commercial sales corporation patna high court has said that if the uh, itc is not utilized then the interest liability under section 50 may not arise however the issue is far from over because in senvet credit context also there are conflicting judgments and the uh, the dispute still goes on but yes it is worth fighting in pratibha processors case supreme court has said that interest is basically a compensation for utilizing somebody's money so we have not utilized the credit there is no there ought not to be a question of giving the compensation to the department in the form of interest coming to there are 
tax collected but not paid to the government. I'll skip this topic. This is again in the line of section 73A uh, of the Finance Act and 11D of the Central Excise Act. If anybody has collected any amount in the form of tax, whether payable or not, he is required to deposit it with the revenue. And for the recovery thereof, even there is no time limit available for the recovery of this. Obviously, because department may come to know about such illegal recovery, maybe after a few years. So the time limit of 73 and 74 will not be applicable if somebody has pocketed some money from the buyer in the form of tax, but not deposited it with the government even though the tax is not payable. Coming to the adjudication process, the friends, when we pre prepare, the first and foremost thing which is to be kept in mind is, just as Brandavan beverage is, the Supreme Court said, that Sokos notice is the foundation of the department case, then similarly, the reply should be treated as a foundation of the uh, SSC's defense right up to Supreme Court. Just as the department cannot go beyond the scope of the SOCOS notice, the, the taxpayer should be presumed to be precluded from going beyond the scope of the reply. Reply to SOCOS notice is not like an old wine, nor, neither the SOCOS notice which can become better and better uh, uh, as it becomes old with the day passing day. No doubt, the taxpayer has got that uh, you know, opportunity to raise additional ground, additional evidence at the appellate stage. But then it is a very risky proposition, which may or may not be allowed by the tribunal and the SSC may lose the case. Therefore, one has to be extremely careful while preparing the defense and filing the reply. Another thing which I would like to point out, as I've been observing this since service tech days particularly, that the litigation under indirect tax and litigation under direct tax are entirely distinct. They are miles apart. There are, it is permissible for you, it may be possible for a tech, uh, you know, someone to really couch this entire difference in three, four paragraphs in a direct tax related scrutiny or the demand which is raised on reopening of the assessment. Because there one would more mainly rely upon the computation, which can be given through the NX charge, and then supported by the judgments. In indirect tax, just as in excise customs and service tax, in GST also, the defense may require elaborate narration of the facts as well as the various grounds. Each of these grounds can be alternative to each other. So merely saying that the learned commissioner or learned deputy commissioner has earned in law and earned in fact will not be sufficient it will be required on our part to say okay, how he has earned in law. If the department has made some wrong presumption, wrong allegation or wrong computation, it is not sufficient for us to say that it is the wrong, the demand is wrongly calculated. How it is wrongly calculated and even if assuming for the sake of argument that the demand is justified, what should be the actual quantum of demand? All these aspects should be brought into the reply. Your reply will bind you and your reply will actually your savior right up to Supreme Court. That should be the fundamental presumption. The second presumption should be every SOCOS notice is going to be the demand is going to be confirmed at the first stage. We are fighting each and every case for losing the case. That should be the presumption. Only the when there is a merit in the case, that should be only taken up for the litigation. One. And then the presumption should be that I'm going to lose at the first stage, even at the first appellate authority stage. The, the justice will be will prevail only at the tribunal or high court or Supreme Court level. Uh, and the first authority is either going to reject my submissions or not going to read my submissions. And the order will be passed only by complete neglect of my submission. That should be the presumption. But I am putting still all the defense because the higher appellate authority will read my defense. That is how the first step in dealing with the defense. Reading the, when you read, read very carefully the date of issue of the SOCOS notice, date of receipt of the SOCOS notice should invariably be marked on the body of the SOCOS notice. Then there will be, in given cases, there can be a list of relied upon documents, which is known as RUD. When there is a particularly an investigation in evasion cases, there will be the seizure of the documents from various cases. There will be statements recorded. All this will be provided only along with the SOCOS notice. 
which will be listed out as a form of RUD. RUD can have two remarks. One, copy supplied. Another, copy available with the party. The first thing to be done is, when such type of SOCOS notice, which has all these enclosures, then it should be rechecked and rechecked that every enclosure which is stated to be enclosed is available. Otherwise, it should be immediately asked for. Similarly, if the documents have been seized, records have been seized, out of which only few records have been relied upon by the department in the SOCOS notice, the other non-relied upon documents should be immediately asked for as a return. It is department's responsibility to return, but it should be immediately asked for. Department cannot retain it on the ground that they may not be relevant for the defense. That is not for the department to say. Party may use it for this defense, may not use it, but it is your right to ask for the non-relied upon documents. And if any statements are provided, which is in a language other than English, then it is your right to ask for the free translation of the Eng in English. Generally, statement actually recorded in language other than English, department itself gives the free translation in English. But if not done, SSC can ask for it. And one has to check the authority who has issued whether he is a proper officer or not. Then read carefully the facts of the case. What is the basis of the demand? Whether it is scrutiny of returns, whether audit objection, whether it is an anti evasion case, whether it is a DGGI case, then what are the nature of allegation? List of the allegation before taking up the narration of the reply, drafting of the reply, very carefully uh, under, try to understand the nature of allegation. What is the basis of each allegation? There will be allegation on merit and there will be allegation relating to the extended period of limitation, for instance, where the evidences will differ. On merit, there will be a particular set of evidence. For the limitation period, there will be another set of evidence. Then there can be an interpretation of statutory provision. Then how the department has interpreted a particular provision so as to sustain their allegation. If any judgments are quoted, then make the note of their judgments. Try to see whether there are contrary judgments or not. There are whether the judgments have been challenged by the where the revenue is relying upon, whether that judgment has been challenged or not. If revenue has raised the demand on the basis of judgment in favor of the party only on the ground that it has been challenged before the higher authority. Uh, if the demand is based on any AR or AR ruling, which they will never cite directly because that cannot be cited. But nobody stops uh, the department from picking up the reasoning from the advance authority ruling and make out a case against another taxpayer. This is the pitfall of going to the advance authority ruling. Uh, I have spoken, uh, spoken time and again on advance authority ruling and uh, why we should completely stop going to the advanced authority ruling. And my answer, if I have to sum up in one sentence, I, I would clearly say that there are better ways of committing suicide. So why to go to advanced authority ruling? Then the, the judgment can, the demand can be based on the technical report, third party statement, discrepancy in records, CBIC circular. It can be a recurring demand, revenue spending appeal, all these should be carefully noted, understood, and then based on that, on each aspect, your defense should be prepared. The computation can be, again, computation of demand is an important part because even if the classification case, the computation may have been done wrongly by adopting wrong valuation or by denying the benefit of an exemption notification or by applying the rate of tax, etc. Then always make a summary of the statutory provisions invoked in the SOCOS notice and their relevance and applicability. There is a 30 days time limit which is given. This is purely an administrative time limit. There is no statutory time limit prescribed for 30 days. Even if 30 days time limit is not adhered to for any reason, the demand may be for 50,000 or it can be for 5 crore, it can be for 50 crore and it can be for 100 crore. In all cases, the SOCOS notice will only give the uh, time limit of 30 days. However, if it is possible to file the reply, fine. If not, please send a letter just before expiry of 30 days that say, saying that the reply, the, uh, you can, I mean, it can be typically read like the notice is received on this and this date. It is being studied by us or it is in, studied by us in legal consultation with our advisors. We intend to file our defense reply in due course of time. However, we deny all the allegations made by the SOCOS notice. And finally, a personal hearing may be granted. So we, uh, this can be the initial letter. And unduly without delaying, ideally one should actually file the reply. However, for any reason, if the reply could not be filed, 
then also at the time of hearing the written submissions can be filed which can be as good as reply reply is not a substitute for hearing hearing is not a substitute for reply so instead of go on asking for the extension if the reply cannot be filed within 30 days one can only send this type of letter it is extension should be asked for only when it becomes really imminent and inevitable otherwise because the second last paragraph of the notice will generally say that if the reply is not filed within 30 days or if you do not appear for hearing when the date is fixed the case will be decided ex parte on basis of written request it is or so reply is a not a substitute for hearing and hearing is not a substitute for the reply one has to see in the given case particularly evasion cases where the third party statements and third party records are relied upon the need for the cross examination it is your you can you may not ask for as a right but nothing stops from us uh, preventing a notice from seeking the cross examination of a people whose statements have been recorded and used in framing the charges against the party a well settled law is there on cross examination and i'm not going into the details uh, because i have a lot to cover but i am not going to rush friends if i cannot cover certain aspects of the appeals i will not rush myself maybe uh, if uh, uh, it is possible maybe we i can continue with that in some uh, other session if uh, you know it is uh, deemed feasible and possible then drafting of the reply of the supposed notice brief background narration every person has his own every uh, you know the uh, tax payer or tax professional is his own way of defending the sofa notice drafting the reply there can be a thumb rule i am certain surprised and amused when i see in the whatsapp group okay, where the standard draft of the replies are also floating around this may not be very very advisable thing to do because every case has its own peculiar facts and when we fall upon the copy paste culture i am sorry to say we may fall into a very very grave error there should not be and when we do really copy paste which is basically the current culture uh, then one has to be extra careful because then you have to apply your brain twice okay, whatever i am copy pasting whether it is really correct or not whether it is pasteable or not so please take every case on its own merit and prepare the defense always uh, you know phrase and any it may not be very advisable to go by the standard draft there can't be then always relevant facts leading to the issue of the so called notice should be clearly narrated exhibits all the document never uh, assume that if i have to rely upon the return ultimately gstr one return is available on the portal to the officer why should i annex the copy he is not going to take out or have a look at the gstr one merely because Uh, it is available on the portal take the print out and then file it along with the reply all the documents ideally when the sokos notice is taken up for the adjudic uh, defense reply one should actually narrate on the side line also on other hand also the chronology of the events not only that the defense which is intended to be taken uh, should also the relevant chronology events should be chronology uh, in a chronology manner should be laid out and They, then the document should be taken out suppose there is a limitation period invoke uh, extended period is invoked one of the argument against the invocation of extended period and evasion is that the everything was within the knowledge of the department either because of the earlier correspondence in the matter or because of the earlier audits taken up so then please take out the relevant documents concerning those correspondence or uh, the audit reports uh, Which year, which audit has taken place? Whether this particular issue has been taken up or not, but ODC is deemed to have actually be aware of that issue, which they have not raised, and then put it into the statement of facts in a chronological order. Uh, so the facts which lead to the so-called notice should be put into the narration, and then those uh, documents relating to audit report or correspondence can become the part of the exhibits when which can be support. Then thereafter referred to in the argument on the limitation. generally i follow the practice of statement of facts and grounds even when i file the reply to the sokos notice so i generally uh, there is a less possibility of missing out in the any significant event in a chronology but it is up to everyone i say that there can't be a, you know the general yardstick of filing the reply 
then uh, the other parties grounds of defense generally you will have to see merits of the case then the limitation then computation all this should be taken up at the time of the in the reply only nothing should be taken to the chance there is no minor ground and there is no major ground in the indirect tax litigation claims a, a, a minor ground can also excuse me for a minute A, even a minor ground can in future can become a major ground and savior for the SAC. Then uh, nothing to be left to the chance. Every Whether it has been challenged, whether the operation has been stayed, revenue has, and on the same point, Hello? Hello? Sir, we request you to please unmute yourself. Sir, are you able to listen me? Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, sir, yes, sir. Uh, sir, can kindly you share your screen again, sir? Uh, say, say screen. Say screen. Sure. You see? Uh, can you see me now? Yes, sir. Sure. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. And you can hear. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, shall I, shall I proceed? No? Hello? Hello? Yeah, you can. Sir, please unmute yourself. Ah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. So. Hello. The adjudication. We phrase it in not this process. Hello. Then uh, there is a cap of uh, the maximum three adjournments. Uh, however, again, this is again uh, depends upon the facts of each case. This does not mean that uh, you know more than three adjournments cannot be given. Again, there is a practice sometimes when because there is a disposal drive to give three dates uh, under a single intimation. This is not a valid practice as held by the tribunal in these cases. Sir? A reasonable speaking order is must. No order can go beyond the scope of the SOCOS notice or can be contrary to the SOCOS notice. This is again a well settled principles of law. Department cannot, adjudicating authority cannot go beyond the scope of the SOCOS notice. Once an officer has passed the order, he cannot review that order. He becomes functions officio. He has discharged his duty, he has discharged his function. And therefore, once he becomes the functus officio, he cannot review his own all order. So there is futile to again make a review application before him, because sir, you have not taken into consideration my plea, or you have made a, uh, you know, the mistake in the, uh, or you have computed the duty demand, uh, tax amount wrongly. Representation before the adjudicating authority. Generally, first of all, one has to be uh, very careful to see that the person who is representing the case is within the scope of the definition of authorized representative as per section 215, read with section 116. There is an elaborate definition of authorized representative. Ideally, depending upon the given case, whether one is appearing before the first adjudicating authority or first appellate authority or first uh, tribunal at any time, GST tribunal is not in existence, a synopsis will always help you. And this synopsis can be prepared. It is a synopsis. It is not the replica or reproduction of the entire defense reply. Please bear it in mind. The synopsis can actually, and sometimes it may happen after passing, filing the reply 
and before the date of the hearing some other important development judicial development may have taken place that can be covered under the synopsis it is if it is found important and favorable then at the time of hearing if it is felt necessary that additional submissions may also required to be filed then one can always take the permission from the authority for uh, allow them to file the additional written submission one can also and should always ask for the records of personal hearing and that records of personal hearing is the party's right to ask for which can be uh, which would be signed by the adjudicating authority on one hand and by the authorized representative on the other hand there are certain do's and don'ts of the adjudication process as far as the socos notice is concerned as i said do make a note of the date of issue of the socos notice also make a note of the date of receipt of the socos notice because the limitation period is required to be computed from the date of communication of the notice and not from the date of the issue of the notice always place an acknowledgement of the receipt of the socos notice uh, whether any socos notice or any communication from the department which is coming by in a hard copy should always be there should be a date of acknowledgement even at least by the pencil one can also ideally keep the envelope do check that old rudes are available do ask for the return of non relied upon documents if any and do ask for the free translation in english of the statement if recorded in language other than english Sir, reply to yes. Ah, uh, sir, actually your screen is not shared, sir. Oh my God. Pratik, please tell me one thing. Sir, let me tell you. Here, I am now for ten minutes. I will be closing. उट <laughs> in the first reply each and every ground should be incorporated it all depends upon the nature of the matter and you know sometimes on the limitation one may have to do more work so one can go for the merits first and limitation later on or it can be other way around there can be a ground relating to the computation of demand which can come separately also there is absolutely no hard and fast rule about this but it should be all before the uh, you know the adjudication proceedings are concluded do provide evidence in support of each contention do check the latest status of the judgment being relied upon do provide copies of the judgment relied upon with the relevant para duly highlighted don't expect the authority to read through the entire judgment and call out ke which para you were referring to so that should be then always try to give if the compilation is bulky reply evidence exhibit then ideally an index should be given with the page number sequential page number given to the reply and do provide legible copy or type copy of each document relied upon in adjudication proceedings ensure that the authorization or vakalatnama is on record wherever required or if it is not filed carry it with you uh, at the time of hearing maintain a dress protocol uh, one should not i always avoid going into the very very casual dress uh, t-shirt and uh, you know even in the virtual hearing please see that one is not sitting in the short pant and arguing just because my face is visible all this should then decorum and nicety should always be maintained we have some three four cases where seniors have been caught in their short pant that's a different matter please maintain dress protocol i am not saying that if you are a, uh, an advocate i should wear the gown black gown also when i am arguing before the adjudicating authority no need obviously we wear gown in court but at least no need to wear maybe black coat also if required but at least there should be decent white shirt whether you wear a tie or not the point is this be very very decent and maintain the decorum carry short notes or synopsis with you which would facilitate the oral submissions if there is a virtual hearing and therefore if the synopsis are going to be prepared by you and referred then see that the synopsis is soft copy is also filed hard copy is also filed beforehand so that adjudicating authority and you can both be on the same page 
and refer to the same or maybe appellate authority. Each question put forward by the adjudicator never try to dodge the question. Not, never try to be evasive when any question is put forward. If it requires some further research, some further study or some further verification, very politely say that I would actually need to get into the, I would need to study or take instruction from my client. And then one can always file it through the additional submissions. But merely because the uh, question is uh, not comfortable or one apprehends some wrong conclusion on the basis of answer, then never try to evade any question whatsoever. And it is also not necessary that every question should be answered there and then. So one can always ask for the time. Always speak slowly, slowly, and clearly. Grow beating or you know, speaking at the top of your noise never will get you any far. Absolutely not. It will only spoil the atmosphere. Maintain the decorum of the proceedings. And few don'ts. Don't address any correspondence by name of the officer. Whether it is the reply to the SOCOS notice or whether it is normal reply to any query from the department, the department is run by the designation and not by the name of the officer. Officer is there today, he may not be there tomorrow. All correspondence should be uh, uh, to the designated authority. Like if it is a reply is to the assistant commissioner, the assistant commissioner of CGST. If it is to additional commissioner, additional commissioner of CGST. It is not Mr. So-and-so, so-and-so, the assistant commissioner. Don't seek adjournment on flimsy ground. If adjournment of the hearing becomes necessary, then very clearly state the reason. Don't fall into the trap of saying that I am out of station or I am. It is very easy for the department to prove in a minute whether you have been out of station, whether you have been in a town and when you claim to be in the Kolkata, in town in Mumbai. So therefore, uh, all these are, uh, you know, age-old practices, no value now. I mean, we have gone too far ahead on this. Don't use harsh or abusive language in any correspondence or communication or reply. Uh, gone are those days, a uh, few decades back, when in the high court pleading also, it was very, very, you know, uh, common to use the words like dishonest and malafide and, you know, all these were now passed. It, uh, such type of abusive or language does not get one any, I mean, too far into this. Be very, uh, you know, the civilized and polite in your language. Don't go by head notes of a judgment. If one is relying upon any judgment, the form, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the principle is that one should read through the entire judgment. If the facts can differ, then although the judgment of Supreme Court can hit you, that even a minor, uh, you know, the difference in the facts can make a hell of a difference. This al Nuri, very old age judgment, it is a potent weapon in the hands of the department. al Nuri judgment has been relied upon in ICICI Econet case to really distinguish the party's argument on say, certain judgments. So it is time and again it, it, uh, it is relied upon. So don't rely upon by the only head notes, go through the judgment. Don't shout or be hysteric during the hearing. Your emotional hysteria and the argument will not again get you any result. Be very polite, be very calm, composed, to the point, firm, clear, explicit. Don't make irrelevant submissions or state irrelevant facts. And most important, don't ever try, one should never try to impress the client while arguing the case. We are arguing the case so that the justice can be fetched for the client. We are not there to impress the client. And therefore, the argument should be made. And if one finds, generally it happens in tribunal, if one finds the tribunal is already with you or authority is with you, there is no need to prolong the arguments unnecessarily just to impress the client. Or just because uh, you have to justify the in a lighter way, one has to justify the fees which is being paid by the client. Don't prolong the argument and don't copy past pleading. I have already uh, dealt with this one. Appeals under GST law. Naminji, it is. Uh, Naminji, are you there? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Your voice is clear. Yeah, Naminji, it is almost now 10 to 7. You know, appeal itself is a very huge topic. Uh, it would not be worth for me to get into this and, you know, in 10 minutes, definitely I will not be able to cover. Uh, I would really request that if it is possible, 
we can have a complete independent session on appeal uh, maybe after a few days whenever convenient then i can take up the questions on the whatever topics i have covered today hello yes sir questions will be in the hello no, my point is this okay, shall we keep the appeal entire appeal related uh, you know the discussion on some other day yes sir sure we can ha uh, because there is no point in i will be doing complete injustice to the topic and the participants by rushing through the appeals no sure sure we can ha uh, it's a important topic and there are quite many things because at least till first appeal at authority though tribunal is not in existence till first appeal at authority and the orders are now flying around i would like to deal with much in detail the appeal related provisions also yes sir it's very fine sir we can take in the next session sir ha uh, yes we can plan it after uh, you know in this month only after a few days whenever yes, convenient sir. to you overall i mean i leave it to you okay right? sir but i would like to you know with the end the session at least this particular session today the session part 1 and we can take up the questions but before that friends uh, so this is all about the soko note this is a never ending topic i have tried to touch upon certain fundamentals and fundamental principles relating to soko notices and adjudication and certain uh, important practical aspects uh, thanks for the patient hearing sorry am i apology for certain uh, you know inevitable technical glitches in between the network has been poor today and uh, connectivity has been the problem but uh, obviously all this entire presentation will be shared by the organizers with you uh, and finally the you know uh, my uh, sincerely i feel really grateful to uh, you for uh, you know very patiently listening to me and uh, now the floor is open to you for the question answers hello sir question will be shared in the chat box sir yeah right ha ah, chat box right i am sharing the same sir yeah right please yeah this is a hot issue about so uh, soco's notice based on third party information 26 as in the line of defense by the notice you see uh yeah uh, before 31st december 2020 uh, i know thousands of soco's notice have been issued on the basis of third party information that is third party is nothing but the income tax so itr returns or the tds returns the point is here there are two types of cases the one where the notice is already registered under service tax and the demand is based on the difference between the itr 26 as visa vis the st3 return and another case is where the notice has not registered himself but his itr in 26 as department comes to the conclusion that it was liable to service tax distinction should be made between these two types of cases always number 1 secondly the whatever may be the worth of the case i am dealing with the cases where the notice is issued to even advocates to doctors hospitals clinics works contractors who are otherwise exempted and host of them all of you must be also coming across all these notices i would not like to first of all jump to the high court in this type of cases there have been two three cases of the high court on this that the notices have been actually declared to be or stay has been granted one should be very very careful in rushing to the high court at the socos notice level in my personal view such socos notices do not really justify rushing to the high court in the first instance one two very carefully check that the figures which have been adopted from itr or 26 as and visa vis st3 whether they are correct uh, one would one should not be surprised if one comes across that the revenue officer has not understood the difference between assessment year and financial year so whereas the demand could be for 13 14 financial year the figures might have been taken of 12 13 and it has happened because this has all come from the delhi data is of in the copy paste mechanically the notice has been issued and once the demand is based on the figures adopted of 12 13 uh, whereas the demand is sought to be for 13 14 the matter should end there 
that should be the first ground number 1 because now the new it cannot be extrapolated or it cannot be substituted by 1314 it will be going beyond making out a new case new so called notice which obviously definitely will be time barred so one should be very firm about this the other part is ascertain the actual factual position from your client and whether the difference is on account of what merely because department has simply mechanically uh, worked out the difference uh, and based on that demand has been raised it does not absolve the notice from giving the reconciliation please be very careful about this nothing stops the department uh, the party from giving the reconciliation third when in almost in all these cases department has not bothered to really get into the differences on what account in many of the cases the department has raised the demand by simply saying that no details or reconciliation or explanation was provided in spite of having sent the mail this is all during the covid period then if this is not factually correct or email has not been received by the party or communication is not received by the party challenge that also though it is it will not uh, be conclusive argument but at least to put the facts on record coming to the difference if the difference is on account of whatever may be the difference it should be clearly brought out and majority of the cases the contention will be that okay, this difference is on account of this where the service tax liability does not arise this should be the defense it may happen that in a given case the liability might have been there but for any reason ssc notice might not have discharged that liability in that case one has to be very careful give the reconciliation if any taxable amount has escaped the tax liability there is no need to make at this stage any further submission because department has not made out any case on that basis ideally department should go into the reconciliation then get into that this amount was actually liable to tax for this reason which has not been paid but if they have simply done the arithmetical uh, exercise and work out the difference and raise the demand then based on the explanation and reply given by the party department cannot say okay, now at least this amount is taxable this is a very intricate and finer line of defense one has to be very careful and last but not the least there is uh, there will be an argument on the basis of the uh, time bar the time bar argument can again have uh, you know the different different shades depending upon the facts of the case where the st3 return is regularly filed by the party and if uh, the difference is not liable to tax the question of invoking extended period does not arise if some amount is liable but party has been entertaining the belief that it is not liable to tax and therefore st3 return does not declare it then it has to be a time bar argument on the basis of the bona fide belief if the registered ssc there has been an audit earlier also an audit is deemed to be aware of the balance sheet have deemed to have taken away the balance sheet with them then it can also be a good ground of defense for the purpose of time bar the point is this in all these cases there has to be detailed reply and the firm the important point to note is please do not get into the copy paste practice each case do take on merit one would be surprised in quite a few cases involving suppose clinical establishment or hospital or doctors also uh, i was surprised to find that they had the taxable income even from the renting of immob property or even with their contractual arrangement of the doctors with the corporate bodies which was held to be it can't be the healthcare service if the doctor is on the consultant role or you know the interacting with the activity actively involved into the research activity of the hospital it is a professional income it can't come under the healthcare services and then if it is not declared then the entire reply will take a different uh, shape i'm just giving you by an example so your reply for your client who is a works contractor and reply for a client who is a doctor reply for a client who is in hospital and reply for a client who is a commission agent can differ so the base can be the itr and 26as one can also take the support from certain judgments 
where it is said that when the demand is merely based on ITR and 26AS, it, uh, the time bar argument can be held. So this is overall the broad uh, aspect which I would get into. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Any other questions? Sure, sure, sir. Sir, question is copied in chat box, sir. No, but chat box, I am. I have opened the chat box. Okay. As on the difference of assessment and education, whether the monetary limit given for is applicable for assessment as well. The central exercise at the board internal text not the board level is missing under 73 or what is the input of this condition? Whether canon judgment can be used to set an assessment by DGBI and survey time? So what is the difference? Oh, all gamut of uh, jurisprudence I am required to get, take into account in this entire case. As I said, assessment and adjudication are entirely different stages of the entire process. There is no formal assessment of the monthly return or the levy by the department right from the excise and service tax days when the self-assessment era was actually ushered in. So, adjudication basically presupposes adjudging. And what is uh, the person is adjudging uh, you know, the adjudication is adjudging some dispute between the parties. There, is, there has to be a lease between the parties. That lease, unless that lease exists, the question of adjudging something or, you know, it does not arise. Adjudicating something does not arise. And in case of assessment, it is a unilateral act on part of the department or revenue officer. He may undertake the scrutiny or the assessment in a given cases. There will not be a normal assessment. That assessment may result into the issue of the SOCOS notice, which will lead to the adjudication. Coming to the tax not levied or not paid, the point here is the levied and payment, you see both are different stages of the collection. As we know that the levy arises when the taxable event takes place, but the collection may be deferred till the stage deemed fit by the legislature. In excise, levy arises as soon as the ex goods, uh, excisable goods are manufactured. But the, the collection is at the point of removal. Now, therefore, unless there is a levy, there cannot be a collection. To that extent, the levy word was important. Because if the process did not amount to manufacture for any reason, or the resultant process did not result into, the process did not result into the marketable product existence, then the levy would not arise. And then there cannot be any collection of the tax. In the case of uh, GST, I think what they have probably not thought it fit because the levied, everything is under now, the taxable event concept is now only on the supply. And therefore, the word levied might not have been used because the word supply is of, of the wide connotation. But in my personal opinion, that even then, before if there is a demand of the uh, GST not paid, the question of taxability can always be there because that is going to the roots of the case. So one can always take the plea that my activity or the consideration, any amount received by me is not leviable to GST at all because it is outside the purview of the charging section 9 read with supply definition section 7. For instance, liquidated damages, one can say that it cannot be treated as a taxable consideration. So irrespective of the omission of the word levied, or absence of the word levied in section 73-74, from the taxpayer perspective, it will not make any difference because the argument on taxability can always be raised. The other part is the canon judgment set aside as a, by the, as a matter of fact, generally I try to avoid mentioning anything in which I am involved. But since this important, very interesting question has come up, the we have already challenged the so-called old India jurisdiction of DGGI in service tax matter in uh, uh, the Karnataka High Court. Arguments are all over. There were lengthy arguments. My uh, partner, Mr. V. Raguraman, Advocate Bangalore, he has uh, been fighting this case. And we are of the view that uh, DGGI in GST also, the old India jurisdiction can be challenged. And we have also challenged the DRI jurisdiction in a few cases where we are in high court on the in the context of the uh, imports and advance authorization matters, and that is much before the Canon India was pronounced. Canon India has only now given a further push to our argument that DRI issue of the sovereignty by DRI is uh, without authority of law. 
and there is no definition of fraud under section 74 such explanations are never defined under the law not even excise customs and service tax they are all elaborated and explained in the catena of judicial pronouncement by the supreme court which are part of my presentation and uh, otherwise we can borrow well, from the dictionary and certain uh, certain definition of fraud i have already cited next question letter issued for turn one audit and while observing we found some error and also paid the same with interest before any order issued by the so will it subject to any penalty no 7356 and they are all very clear on this once it is paid then there is no question of penalty next sir uh, can we take question next time uh, on the next uh, webinar sir uh, no because no, there are more than 20 25 question pending sir right now okay okay so we can uh, i can send you the word file uh, yeah you... complete word file tra transcript complete comment uh, you please send it across to me yeah so we can uh, next time uh, what i will do is uh, we will we will work it out how do we go about the question on this session yes, and sir. the question on the next session fine sure. we can for the timing we can uh, stop here fine uh, thank you so much participants sir For more than two hundred twenty participants in the webinar today, it was a great session, sir. You covered almost all aspects of SCN and education, sir. And thank it was a very all waiting for us to connect with every time, sir. I request, uh, I thank all participants for joining us today. It was very worth. Uh, like we have gained so much of the knowledge with the Salish sir. Uh, hope we will submit it the next time for the appeals with the Salish sir again, sir, in the coming months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Later. I leave. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you.